static facial spasms. <laughs> My brow beaded with fervent inspiration, and I immediately and urgently called for the nurse to remove about six kilometers of invasive tubing, administer an uninhibited sponge bath, open a bottle of Bollinger, and hand me pen and paper. <laughs> I was at Leo's obliged to only one count. <laughs> And 18 drafts later, this book is the result. <laughs> Don't you wish I'd had that sponge? <laughs> Why Dogs Are Better Than Cats is especially exciting for me, as it is my first book following the conclusion of a very rewarding decade-long apprenticeship known as the Blue Day Book Series. Now, of course, being a uh, humorous, illustrated work, it doesn't seem such a radical departure, but it is Still, a fresh start in many ways. First of all, I was, God help us all, given much more freedom in regards both the length and scope of my comic prose. And I was given license to add dozens of deliciously fatuous end notes, and thus was able to include all manner of joyous asides and obscure supporting commentary from uh, history of reading the entrails uh, by various pagan soothsayers practical steps to the mummification of cats, <laughs> <laughs> nanotechnology oh. concerns, the real reason why the Pelusian Wars ended the reign of the pharaohs, and insights into Harold Bloom's little black book. <laughs> I don't feel I've overstepped my mind at all. <laughs> Let me just say that the motivation for these end notes came rather tragically from the demise of David Foster Wallace which occurred whilst I was writing the book. A great loss to literature, a wonderful mind, tormented though it was. And for DFW, of course, his great reams of footnotes were a way that he could vent and validate the many voices in his head to which, so tragically, he ultimately succumbed. It was also a way to cram as many vivid impressions, jokes, and nuanced uh, contentions as humanly possible. And that's something that I thought, what, you know, why not? What a great little tribute, even if only this room will know about it. <laughs> <laughs> so after reading Consider the Lobster again, and essays from a supposedly fun thing I'll never do again, uh, I enjoyed adding these, these end notes. Uh, and in case you're wondering, I personally do not hear voices in my head. Uh, though I do worry that everyone else in this room is paranoid. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the second wonderful thing for me to make this book different to all the others is that I was able to bring in uh, one of Australia's most awarded designers, Gaynor Murphy of Green Dot Design, who is a genius, and it was such a thrill, and we'll be working on a new book, in fact, we've already started. Uh, I gave her an extraordinarily poor brief. I said, I want the book to feel like you walked into your favourite living room, and mix that with the French cult classic comedy, Amelie. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and I need it in 12 weeks. Why? <laughs> My numbers are missing. <laughs> she did deliver, and it's absolutely sunny. She lifted this book to a whole new, mm. a whole new stride. Mm. Third, I was able to invite one of the world's most successful, and certainly the best, pet portrait photographers, Rachel Hale. An international best-selling author in her own right, with sales now surpassing mm -hmm. two and a half million copies. Mm -hmm. You know, rolls up the sleeve, dive in the dirt, get the shot. She's she's wonderful to work with, and the work yeah. tells. And that was the exciting thing. See, the, all the Blue Day book series, I must have been through 200,000 images, average of 10 to 15,000 per book oh, wow. that I go through from libraries and estates and photographers. This book, almost all of it, was shot to order on the script. Mm -hmm. wow. So huge stress for her having to match up with the narrative, and I gave outlines what we should have and some sketches, but ultimately she had to deliver it, and boy didn't she, and you'll see that.